Welcome to the second uh, video in this series about the placebo and the nocebo effect. Uh, really looking forward to doing this video. We're going to look at a couple more stories, uh, research stories, which will demonstrate the strength of, uh, of this effect. And uh, there's a video that I'm going to be showing and uh, commenting on uh, also today, which I um, have to warn you about. Uh, some of you of a more sensitive nature might uh, might need to look away, but it's yet again a fascinating example of the reality of this effect. And also, it's like how sceptical people, people who quite justifiably may feel very sceptical about this type of um, these type of ideas, how they're likely to react and the scepticism that you may have uh, towards it as well. What, what might be behind that? So let's kick off today's video with a quote from Gandhi. Uh, the quote is, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. And your values become your destiny. Provocative thought from Gandhi there. And we're going to return to that thought at the end of the video. But uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, the, uh, the couple of books that I'm taking this research from uh, so that you can also uh, deepen your knowledge, uh, take your research further, become more convinced that this is something real. So the first book is a book which was a, a huge seller in the, uh, in the 1980s and 90s called Getting Well Again by O. Carl Simonton and the first story that I look at is going to be taken from there and the second story uh, or the second piece of research I should be saying um, is by a lady called Jean Achterberg. Uh, this book is called The Rituals of Healing and also uh, documents lots of really fascinating studies into this uh, area of how the mind can have a huge effect on your well-being, on your physical health, but obviously on your mental health as well. So who was this uh, O. Carl Simonton? Well, he was an oncologist and uh, he, in the early 70s, he was working at Travis Air Base for the, uh, for the US Air Force in, uh, in California. And uh, he became chief of radiation therapy uh, at the base there. And he had some, he had some interesting experiences, which he, which he documents in the book, which led him to question what, what was happening. So the scenario he sets up is he, these cancer patients were coming in often with almost identical diagnoses. So they might have a, a particular, so you might have two people with identical, ident more or less identical cancers uh, at the same stage of growth, same stage of maturity, yet and they received the same uh, therapy, of course, the, the same chemotherapy and the same drugs. But what really puzzled Simonton was the dr dramatic divergent results that some of them would be dying, uh, would die ahead of their prognosis, and other people would outlive their pro prognosis. And whilst this is this is very natural, his his scientific mind starts to ask the question: What is are there factors in here 
that are affecting this and what could they be? And over his years at the base, it's like one of the ideas that he's entertained to try and resolve this, this, this uh, puzzle was, could it be the state of mind of people? Because his own observations where it seemed to be the people that were full of, uh, full of fight, who are optimistic, also who sometimes like challenged him as well, that uh, they were the ones that were surviving whereas the submissive and the negative ones, they were more likely to die earlier than, than, uh, than their diagnosis predicted. Um, in the, in the mid-70s, or 1973, he started his own, own clinic in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, and as the director of that clinic, he was then in the position to to actually perform a study and to test this idea as to test this idea is it the mind that is having this uh, dramatic effect on how long patients are likely to survive uh, his, his clinic was um, a place where basically where terminal cancer patients cancer patients who had basically been told by their doctors in other parts of Texas, I'm sorry, but, uh, but I can't help you anymore. I've run, out of, I've run out of ideas as to how you might combat this cancer, how we might beat it. And the, it was these type of people that ended up um, being treated at this cancer clinic, in, in uh, or Simonton's Cancer Clinic in, in Fort Worth, Texas. So they're all terminally ill, and the statistics uh, were very clear that the average lifespan for people uh, coming to this clinic, basically they had 12.2 months uh, average lifespan, and then that was it. So like the, the, years of, the re years of research on it were very clear there. So what uh, what Simonton decided to do is he set, he had a he had a trial group with um, 159 patients, all of them terminally ill, and he was going to see if by using the imagination whether they could influence the progress of the cancer in these patients. And again. This has to be, this is grossly simplified. There are a lot more details in the books, or in, in his book. What they were trying to do was get, get the patients to create their own pictures that were symbolic of them beating the cancer. They weren't told what to imagine what they were told to do is was to create imagery that was symbolic of how they beat the cancer. So, for example, uh, in in the in the book, what we what we can read is sort of like how one young boy, a, a twelve year old, um, his chosen uh, method for for combating his cancers in a mental way uh, was to uh, imagine him playing Space Invaders where he was zapping the cancer cells and they were dying. Some people chose to imagine their cancer cells melting in the sun. They were, they were bits of ice and they were melting under the heat of the sun, them representing the sun. And another one, um, the, just for the craziness, so I want to, uh, that I, I find it uh, funny to imagine myself is, one person describes how they uh, they imagine themselves being out in the wild west. It's like a, a, like a lone ranger with a lasso, it's l launching out with their with their lasso and uh, capturing the the cancer cells, taking control, being in control. That that was the basic theme of what was uh, what these people were imagining it here. 
whilst they were imagining these, they were undergoing normal therapy, normal chemotherapy here, so there was no change there. They were supporting their chemotherapy, the, the effects of chemotherapy, with the imagination. And this study, it ran for four years, and at the end of the four years, uh, what they found was that 63 people were still alive, and that is already v quite interesting. Uh, but let's break down those figures. So, so of these 63 that were still alive, what, what did, if, we, if we pick over the details, what do we find? We find that 14 of them, so that is just under 10% of the people that were involved in the whole survey. Remember, they were all terminally ill. Okay, 14 out of the 159 that started, they were completely cancer free. The cancer had completely disappeared. Okay. In 12, also slightly under 10%, the cancer was in regression. I want to stress it again, remember these were all supposed to be terminally ill, on average they should have been dead three years ago. And then finally, the 17, so over 10% of the people involved in the studies, their cancer was static. Okay. So a net result after this uh, at the end of this four-year study was that the average life expectancy had risen from 12.2 months to 24 months by adding this element of imagination in a healthy direction, in a positive, meaningful direction, had doubled the average life expectancy of this group. In the words of the uh, patients, uh, they describe how this radiation treatment, it so let, seemed to be so let, somehow magical because not only were they surviving longer, but they were also having less negative side effects. It's like damage of membranes and mucus, the type of things that happen when you, when you bombard your um, living cells with radiation. These negative effects, uh, effects were also reduced in, the, in, this, in this group, which was in itself very interesting. One would expect, one, I would expect, I think most reasonable people would expect that this type of evidence, which is very encouraging for people, it gives them an ability to take control of their own health, that it would have been advocated that, uh, the, for example, the American Cancer Society would be keen to promote this type of research, or at least uh, encourage like further studies to confirm whether this was sort of like statistically abnormal or whether it actually represented some type of truth. But the real world um, often isn't as we would like it to be. And uh, in Simonton's case, he was actually put in 1981 on the quacks list, uh, or the list for unproven methods. And it wasn't until 19 years later, in the year 2000, that he was silently removed from this, uh, from this quack list uh, by the American Cancer Society. And uh, this was in part due to pressure from people that sort of like knew of his good work, but also a recognition that these ideas were becoming more and more part of um, a regular cancer treatment and that it also brought about a sea change in, uh, in legislation that compelled um, hospitals 
to actually to provide some type of mental health care to complement the physical, the radiation, the chemotherapy that was going on because the results had been so convincing. So even if Simonton didn't receive uh, praise for his work, uh, the effects of his research are fortunately living with us now. Okay, so uh, why do I why do I love these stories? Let's uh, let's go just go for two points here. I think uh, one of the things that I like about it is it's this it gives hope for those people that the system hasn't been able to help. It creates the idea in us that actually I can do so much more. I am not a victim. I can actually take active steps towards improving my health. And I think that's a hugely liberating um, mental attitude to have. And not only is it, does it feel liberating, evidence from people like Simonton, and there is so much more evidence, indicate that it has a real effect. So not only do we feel more empowered, but we really, really in physical terms are more empowered. It's a, is that truly a win-win situation? And the second reason I like it, obviously, is it is yet again clear evidence that what is going up on up here in our minds has effects that real effects that we couldn't have imagined were true it's like just 20 years ago if you look at the research in the area or it's like what is generally accepted by by mainstream science uh, scientists would have been laughed out of the room and also there we've seen a huge sea change in that it is becoming, it hasn't become, but it is becoming more acceptable for people to think that the mind has a significant um, effect on the, on the healing process. Uh, 20, 30 years ago when I was a teenager, it's, people were still sort of like thinking, how, how can it, were they questioning, they were questioning, stress, it, it's just in the mind, it's not real. But now we've got the, the, there is so much data out there that says that, no, you know, we, we had it all wrong there, that stress is real. It's real in the mind. It's painful being stressed in the mind. And that pain also translates itself into real physical effects in the body. So what was real up here eventually becomes real inside the body and I think it's important to to recognize the the chain of events here um, because this is this is what the whole mind body question revolves around is they're starting here and they're ending here in the body they're starting in the mind and ending in the body so the more control, the greater awareness I have of what is going on up here means that I have a better chance of influencing the effects on my body, on my physical health. In the previous video we looked at very concrete cases of placebo and the SIBO effect, how we can dramatically strengthen or dramatically weaken effects depending on what's going on up here. And this Simonton story is a further demonstration of the reality of this effect. The second researcher I'm going to look at is a lady called Jean Achterberg, who was a uh, doctor of psychology in San Francisco. Was a, a, but she died two years ago, and. 
this lady was actually inspired by some of the work of Simonton and decided to do her own research. And she did a lot of research and I want to focus on one particular study because again, the, the reality of it is so fascinating um, and has led me to look more into how the immune system works and all these type of fascinating things about how amazing we are as human beings. I mean, the wonders that happen in our body, the, the 60 trillion cells that make up our body, what's happening? They are the basis of us experiencing ourselves. And here, focus on the two trillion or so cells that make up our immune system, our defense system. The defense system that when it is weakened, lays us flat on our back and makes us incapable of almost anything. So, Achterberg, uh, uh, she was interested, she had this idea that, well, can we directly influence our immune system uh, with, with our thoughts? Simonton's research had indicated that was the case, but so like going down to a more detailed level, so uh, she was looking at the white blood cells. White blood cells are those that don't remember their biology lessons. Uh, white blood cells are those beings, those, uh, those cells that actually that attack invaders coming into our body. And there are essentially six types of white blood cells and uh, we're going to divide them into to like two groups. We've got, uh, we've got one group called the neutrophils. The neutrophils are ones that we, that these are the white blood cells that attack invaders that the body already knows are invaders. It's a little bit like if we imagine in a shooting war, uh, you've got an army on one side, let's sort of like imagine they're painted, they're all in red. And then on the other side of the battlefield, I mean, we're going to have to go back a couple of hundred years to imagine this because, uh, but so like just going back to Napoleon where they clearly wore different colours. It was very clear then, so like at the Battle of Waterloo, that the English, the Reds, that was one team, that was one side. And on the other side, we had the, the French in their blue. There were also other armies involved there but so I don't want to go there okay so you've got two armies so uh, French guy comes over so like the English guy it's like knows that so like he's the enemy I have to kill him and that's how neutrophils work and the French obviously thought the same about the British yeah so neutrophils work by killing known enemies but what about unknown enemies Let's say, from an English perspective, um, I've got my red jumper on, uh, fortunately, it wasn't planned. Let's say a French guy at the Battle of Waterloo, he decided to put on it's like a red coat like the, uh, like the British. Then how would the British know to shoot him? Well, they would have to like find out more information. And... The body in a, similar, in a similar situation, when it's defending itself against unknown enemies, it has to, it has to activate the second group of, uh, of uh, white blood cells, which are the lymphocytes. Okay? So we've got two types here. We've got, the, we've, got the, uh, we've got the neutrophils for known enemies and lymphocytes for unknown enemies. And the whole time, these are the these are the little beings that are maintaining our health. The two trillion or so cells that, uh, that make up our immune system, that make up our defense system. So Achterberg, she wondered, can, is it possible for people to influence the relative balance of them? Uh, neutrophils make up around about 60% and one type of lymphocytes, there are several types of lymphocytes, make up around about 24% of the, of the blood cells and the white blood cell count. So she was interested, can, can we sort of like change, the, 
change the ratio. At the moment it selects 60 to 24. Can we select, just by thinking about it, reduce the number, the relative number of neutrophils? Or, or can, and, and at the same time, can we increase the lymphocytes? And is the, other, is the opposite possible as well? Can we, given this ratio, if we think about it, can we increase the number of neutrophils and decrease the number of lymphocytes? So that was, that was the question. Can we, with our mind, change this balance? Huge potential consequences for our immune system and health, obviously. If you can, with your mind, affect this balance, then you become able to, of controlling your health in a way at a, at a far deeper, more physical level than, again, most people would consider possible. So in this, uh, in this research, in uh, 1988, I believe, uh, they had a relatively small group, which is a disadvantage with this study and has to be recognised, uh, over a six-week period, uh, the participants, they were um, encouraged to create imagery for themselves that would represent them having more neutrophils, a greater percentage of neutrophils, or a greater percentage of lymphocytes. And at the end of the study, at the end of this six-week study, what they were able to demonstrate is that purely with the mind alone, they were assisted by music, um, seems to help the concentration process, they were able to do exactly what they hoped to be able to do, i.e. change the the number of neutrophils in their blood or change the number of lymphocytes. So let's just pause there for a second. How many of you out there wake up in the morning thinking, hmm, I wonder what my white blood cells are doing at the moment. I wonder what the relative ratio is. And I'm sure that 99 <laughs> 99.9, .9, if not 100% of you are saying, no, I never even give it a thought. However, what the research is demonstrating is that if we begin to think in that direction, we actually start to cause real physiological changes in our system. Isn't that magical? Truly magical. Something of which, over which we have no awareness. But somehow, our mind, in ways that we, we still don't understand, but somehow our mind is able to affect these. Just uh, a couple of statistics around that research from Achterberg. Uh, when they tried to, using the mind, to change the balance of neutrophils, what they found is a p-value of less than, um, less than 0.04, which means, in, in scientific language, there is a strong presumption that the mind, the imagery in this case, that the mind was causing the change. On the lymphocyte side, there is an even smaller reading. Even smaller means even more conclusive in this case. Uh, a p-value of uh, less than 0 0.03, which again is saying that it seems highly suggestive. There is a strong presumption here that the mind is causing these changes and not it's just chance that's causing these.
And in the final part of this video, I'm going to look at a fascinating guy, uh, a guy called David Blaine. This man, you might already know of him, this man came to my attention when I found out that uh, he could hold his breath for 17 minutes. He could hold his breath for 17 minutes. When you look at this guy, you can see his uh, you can see his videos on YouTube. He goes into how he trains both his body and his mind to achieve what for you and me would be at the moment is impossible. But what David Blaine is trying to encourage us to think is that if you believe it's impossible, you will prove yourself right. If you believe it is possible, you will also prove yourself right. And uh, this is actually a very similar, similar conclusion to what Apterberg uh, came to as a result of her own uh, 30 year, three decades worth of working with people is that if you believe the mind can affect your health, then you will prove yourself right. If you believe your mind cannot, affect your health, then you'll prove yourself right. So, back to David Blaine. Uh, I like this video a lot and I'm going to show it to you. In the video, he, he, uh, he meets uh, the guy from the office whose name escapes me at the moment. What we see is David Blaine speaking to uh, Ricky Gervais of Office fame the comedian, and Ricky Gervais is a sceptic to all things uh, wishy-washy otherworldly, and the reaction to David Blaine's um, trick here is, uh, it, it speaks volumes. So, what... Uh, what happens in this video is David Blaine, he sticks a needle, a sailor's needle, through his arm all the way through. So it's, uh, Ricky Gervais can see it on the other side and then he asks him to pull it out. Um, and he's, he's wincing as, as he's doing this, as you can see in the video if you watch it. But it's, it's the last bit of the conversation that again is so, so fascinating, so telling, is that Ricky Gervais, in his scepticism, he says, this is crazy. The, look, I, you've done a trick, but it's not a trick. It's a little bit like this conversation we had in the previous video. It's sort of like, what is really, if the trick, what is real? The, the, the trick wasn't a trick, but it's called a trick, but it's real. Um, is what is real the what's going on in my head? Or is what's real, it's like what is happening in my body? The label that I give it. I do think it's central to grasping the importance of this. Um, this whole phenomena, this whole mind-body phenomena. Well, it looks really real, right? I don't understand. Right, okay. Obviously, if, that's, if that is a trick, how is that a trick? How is that not a needle going through your fucking arm? You know what, Ricky, here, do me a favor. Grab the needle right here. Yeah? And pull it out so you can see the magic trick. Go ahead, grab it. Yeah, good. Grab what do you it. mean? Yeah, grab pull it, it out, out sure. although it's come. Yeah, yeah, pull it out. Good. Just pull it right out. <laughs> right, okay. Pull it out. Is that needle going through your arm? Well, pull it out and you'll see how it works. Pull it. Oh, fuck me! 
Paul. I don't understand. Paul. Paul. Oh, Paul. David, what have you Paul. done? Are you a maniac? Paul. This is real. Sorry, this is real. That's real. That's not a trick. Oh, not... for fuck's sake. <laughs> Fucking hell. I don't, that's not, a, that's, that's real. There's no, that's, he stuck a needle through his arm. One area that I also want to highlight is that this mind-body relation, even though we've talked about it for, for white blood cells, for cancer and David Blaine, there is also a lot of evidence out there showing how um, the mind can have a direct Im influence on blood pressure, hypertension, how we can, how certain people seem to be able to use their minds to control body temperature, how other people can cause their heart to stop. And now technically they don't actually stop is what actually happens. They, they start beating at 300 times a minute, but that makes the, the, uh, the, pulse feel untraceable. Again, none of these things are recommended uh, to do, just like I wouldn't recommend you sticking a needle in your arm like David Blaine can. The important thing is, is what they point to is the ability that we all have, because whether it's David Blaine, Simonton, Achterberg, or Jack Schwartz, or the, the hundreds, if not thousands of people out there that are that have demonstrated these effects are that we are all capable of these, of, of using our mind to affect our body, but it is a skill. And like with any skill, it requires development, it requires practice. So, in this video, we've talked about uh, Simonton, cancer research, using the mind to battle, uh, battle these invaders. We talked about Achterberg, how we can consciously change the workings of the immune system the, with the white blood cells. And then finally, the particularly graphic uh, video with uh, David Blaine sticking a needle uh, through himself. So, we're back at the beginning. We started with Gandhi saying, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values and your values become your destiny.